Hello and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is December 23rd, 22nd, 2015. Um, and we're broadcasting or recording from the First Unitarian Church in Salt Lake City today. Um, and I'm here with two uh, very exciting guests for me. Um, I'm here with uh, a very old friend. He's not very old, but our friendship is quite old. Oh, I'm um, old. Are you old? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt Elgren. Uh, Matt Hi, and John. I. Hey, Matt. Welcome to Mormon Stories. Thanks. Is this bizarre for you? Very bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt and I go way back. If you think about when I first started going through my faith crisis while I worked at Microsoft, Matt and my uh, good friend Paul Mayfield, we used to sort of sneak out at lunchtime sometimes while we worked at Microsoft. We would go to the Wendy's or the Red Robin. We would have lunch and we would talk about all this mind blowing stuff that we were first learning sort of before podcasts and Mormonism, before CES letter, before Mormon think, before blogs, before all that stuff. And, um, you know, I, Matt and I were good friends while we lived in Washington. But then in 2004, when I moved to Logan uh, and start Mormon stories and all that, you know, our lives just continued kind of in parallel. Um, we'll talk about my relationship with Matt and his faith journey. Um, uh, but but the reason why this is so interesting is because we're going to be talking about Matt's um, experiences having lost his faith, but then staying in a marriage where his wife remained uh, and remains to this day a believer, his wife, Lori. So Matt's sort of been, uh, from my perspective, sort of a good soldier supporting his believing wife and and raising their children together in a mixed faith marriage. Um, and Matt's just, uh, in, in my experience, wise and thoughtful just uh, to start with. Um, and he was an important influence for me. So it'll be great to hear his story. But where this gets really interesting for me is that the other day uh, I got a phone call from Matt where he told me that his brother-in-law, so his wife's brother, Clay Christensen, who's also joining us today, um, had recently also lost his faith in the church. Now, Clay um, is also very interesting. Uh, Clay works in the IT industry. He worked several years. How many years, Clay? Almost seven years. Worked seven years uh, for uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, church headquarters in their sort of IT department. We're not going to talk a lot about that today. It is a coincidence because we just got through interviewing Daniel Miller, who also worked for a few years at the church. Um, but but um, but Clay worked under my brother, Joel, so they knew each other for many years. And what's really interesting to me about this story, uh, it's sort of two things. Uh, one is we're going to be hearing from Clay sort of, you know, if we just go back six weeks, Clay was a devout sort of TBM, died in the wool, hardcore, believing Mormon, sending his son on a mission, and I would say 120% committed to the church. And he's 50. So, I mean, this Clay went 50 years, full board, TBM, in the church, working seven years for the church. And six weeks ago, he had his big moment where he it all fell apart for him. So, we're going to talk about Clay's story. But we're going to start with Matt's story. And then we're going to talk about how those stories sort of converge now. Because in many ways, Matt has been sort of feeling quite alone in his family as sort of having no one who really gets or understands his experience um, in many ways in his family. And now after Matt waiting patiently for, let's just say 15 years, um, Clay has now sort of joined him as someone who sees his point of view and shares it. And we're gonna talk about how that affects now, um, you know, Matt's family, his relationship with his wife, who is Clay's uh, sister. And we're just gonna talk sort of these major themes about families, about faith journeys, about mixed faith families, and about how all that works together, um, and how dialogue and open communication, along with investigation and study and learning, sort of all play together. And I think it's gonna be sort of an epic interview. Um, now, Matt, do you wanna correct anything that I said no, so far? Does that sound all right? right? You're right on. Is that all right? That okay, speak great. right in that mic. That's all right. That sounds great. Okay. Clay, you want to correct anything? No, sir. 
Okay. I hope we can live up to that because it, it sounds interesting to me and I hope we can do it justice. <laughs> yeah. Well, Clay, welcome to Mormon Stories. Thank you. As well as Matt. Um, Thanks, John. All right. So we're going to begin, I think, with Matt's story. Um, okay. Let's just go back. So you and I, uh, we met quite a bit ago, but your faith journey probably began before that. So let's... Let's spend some time talking about your own journey. Okay, that sounds good. I, I, there's so many things you can say about a life, you know. So I've been thinking a little bit about what are the major themes that I think are still at play in my life today that are, have always been really meaningful to me. And just to give you some quick background, I, I'm from a multi-generational Mormon family. Uh, my early memories were moving around a little bit between Salt Lake City and Brigham City, Las Vegas, but always in the kind of Mormon community by and large. And, and being raised with family home evening, going to church every Sunday, uh, being baptized and all the things you wouldn't typically expect of, a you know, being raised Mormon. And I have really good memories of these things, uh, honestly. But one thing I want to just call out is, I, that maybe is a, somewhat unique. Um, I was, there was, from early in my childhood, I heard, I was hearing things from my parents and my mother in particular about our heritage as members of the church. Um, how we're how blessed we were to be related to key members of church history. In particular, um, my mother is a descendant of a couple of, very, of somewhat famous people. One is Brigham Young through his wife, Emily Partridge. And, uh, another is her, her, uh, great grandmother, uh, uh, Ruth May Fox. And, also Vida Fox Class. And these are people that I was raised to really honor and respect and strive to be like. Um, we did many things as I was a kid growing up to stay close to these things. Uh, we were active in the Brigham Young Family Association. I remember going to Brigham Young Family dinners and fat, you know, in retrospect, very fascinating experience with the different, the families of the different wives <laughs> and having a real sense then of the, the station of each wife kind of transition, uh, spanning across generations where some people felt that they they were descended of the favorite wife or the first wife. And there was really this real, it was inter, I mean, it was, so there was family life. pride Stemming from which wife exactly, which of Brigham Young's wives you just think exactly, from. and, and, and that was felt at the family reunion, right? And it's just this little microcosm of, and above all things, we're all descended from Brigham Young, yeah. Um, and feeling a lot of pride and and drawing a lot of my identity from this from these things. Uh, and I'll just quickly interject here. Much later in my life, I I came to realize that there's if you add a little perspective to this. You have many people you're descended from. Um, and so much of my per feelings about my ancestors now come from those that I don't know, that I didn't know what their struggles were and what their stories were. But at the time, these were the ones that were really emphasized. And and the uh, non-Mormon ones get lost, right? So I want to say something about this. There is, <laughs> there, there is no, no story of non-Mormons that I can remember. Yeah, and this this goes in hand in hand with how the church teaches us as from childhood about respecting our ancestors, the ones who sacrificed and uh, gave up whatever their lives were and joined the church and made so many sacrifices. That these are the people we honor and cherish and we want to strive to be like, and above all, that we wouldn't want to betray in any way. Uh, so. So just to we'll go a little further down on the topic of the Brigham Young side, um, at one point, my mother told me about her grandfather. Uh, his name is Chester Clausen, and he was married to 
one of Brigham's daughters. Or excuse me, his mother was one of Brigham's daughters. So he's a grandson of Brigham Young. And my mother got to know him. And he was a black sheep in her family. At some point in his life, he had experiences where... I mean, it's funny, it really touches me. Because it, because I identify it with it. But uh, he and his brother were early on in the, uh, the industry of film production. They had an office in downtown Salt Lake City, close to Temple Square, where they were uh, working with film and producing film. And there was a fire. And at the time, film burned very quickly and hotly, and people died in these kind of fires. And his brother, they were partners, and his brother died. And my mother told me this story to tell me that he, he that Chester was never the same after that. That he just started to distance himself from the church. That he spent time... I mean, his he was married to a prominent leader in the church and she or or his his wife's mother was a prominent leader in the church Ruth Mae Fox so his mother-in-law and his grandfather is Brigham Young and yet he's living in Salt Lake City and he's not he's distanced himself from the church and my mother would t- told me the story and it wasn't and it was but it's one of those stories that you say quietly. It's not meant to be a um, a story that inspires faith. It's just there's this person in our family that did this thing. Later in my life, I found out there were similar people. Go what, ahead. What is so touching uh, well, for you so, about that? Why why did you get emotional telling that story? Um, what does that mean to you? I now? do what feel. Does it mean to you now? I feel like. So many people are lost in history because they don't they don't meet people's expectations of what they should be. And yet they're equally our ancestors. They their sacrifices shouldn't be forgotten. And yet we do, we don't talk about them. Because they, that his story in some way is a risky story to talk about openly. Um, I mean, a, a grandson of Brigham Young, after all, right? How could that happen? Um, so, and and I, th- I think I just felt like I wanted to know more about people like that in my life. I'd had so much of the stories of people that were the Brigham Youngs, right? Um, and you, it's, you can't deny that. So are you studying these bef- while you're still a believer, or is this stuff that's happening? This is just stories I would hear. I, my okay. mother had told okay. me this story. Okay. And, and there, over the years, she's told me a few things about her relationship with him. That uh, I mean, they were basically, they were divorced, essentially. Um, and her time with him was more kind of a side thing going on. Yeah. So... Uh, and I was just aware of this. Yeah. Okay. So it, I, I tell that story because it was some of my earliest memories of feeling like I'm connected to people that I know nothing about and asking myself, why? Why don't, why are we talking so softly about people, like th- these people? In many instances now looking back, some of these yeah. people who left may have been super courageous or noble or interesting. And I can see a point that like their stories deserve being remembered and honored as well. Right. Regardless of church-related outcome. And th- and they're not because of church-related yeah. outcome, which is, th- that's, the, that's just what it is. Yeah. So... And that's something that we face... Every day. Yeah. You know, will our, ans- will our descendants remember us if we leave, right? Right. How yeah. will they remember us? How will stories be told about us? Yeah. Um, it's interesting to think about. Right. Yeah. So that's had, a, obviously, as you can tell, a, a profound impact on me just thinking about it and I uh, to be honest with you I have been inspired in some ways by knowing that I have ancestors that chose differently 
and call it courage. You choose to live and stay with close to your other family and stay in your community, but be a something of a pariah and you accept it. That to me is inspiring and a beautiful thing to know. So, so there's that. And I was just like, I want to put that in contrast to the overarching message growing up, just being very proud of my ancestry uh, and raised that way. And there were times when I thought I should be a leader in the church too. Why? Because of my ancestry. And you, you know, you sometimes might hear people question whether that's a real thing in the church, but I can tell you for this little boy growing up, that's how I saw it. I saw a potential connection to Joseph, a very strong connection to Brigham, a tradition of generations of leadership in the church as my heritage. And I felt like I was supposed to be that. And it got, it, it, it was the foundation of a lot of my choices early on in my life about what I would study, what I would do, what I thought I, how who I would marry. So what are those choices? Go talk through those choices. So choices like in high school, do I study what I'm interested in, electronics, things like that? Or do I say, no, I'm going to focus on going on a mission and I want to be a leader in the church, which means being more of a business person. Do And, and the, my ideas about who I was supposed to be were really driving these decisions, not my ideas about who, what I deep down want, thought I was or hope to be or what or want I like doing those kinds of things. And the, the story arc of my entire life has been finally coming to the realization that those things in a lot of ways, aren't me. The and, things you chose. Right. That I had a view of myself of yeah. that wasn't in line with myself. Yeah. And you spend years and years. And in my case, decades and decades coming to terms with that through painful reality, you know, you do and you act according to who you really are, not according to who you think you You are or who you should be. And you have a lot, and I had lots of experiences. Uh, Like I, I came back from my mission and I was convinced I needed to, where'd you serve? I was in Germany, Munich mission. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there's a little story there because I met Laurie Clay's, sister for the first time in Salzburg when I was only on my mission for about three months. Okay. So, uh, was she a missionary? She was in Vienna on study abroad with BYU. Okay. So, so and you got a wandering she, I was her roommate. A so th- that's the, that's the easy <laughs> thing to presume, right? <laughs> Merlin, tell them right? Yeah. So, but her cousin Merlin Hafen, uh, was my, he was the companion that was, we were a foursome and sharing an apartment and he was in the other a uh, couple of missionaries and she came to visit him okay. her cousin all right and we got permission from the stake president or I mean from the mission president for her to spend a day just going around with us visiting the members and seeing the sites in Salzburg and things like that so that's where I remember going to this train station in Freilassing which is just on the other side of the border in it's in Germany uh, and meeting Laurie there getting off the train from Austria or from uh, Vienna and then spending the day walking around, seeing things, uh, eating apple strudel and mem- making it and eating it at a member's house. Laurie always tells me that I helped her by eating what she didn't want to eat because <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> uh, and these kinds of things. And at that time, they, uh, I realized that I knew Laurie's brother from my high school years because my first job when I was in high school at East High was working at Smith's on 9th and 9th as a bagger and Clay was a checker and I had this memory of her brother and I mentioned it to her as like I know Clay my memories of Clay were he was uh, I was uh, pretty young I was a sophomore in high school and he was I believe a senior at the time because he was talking about going and uh, joining the Navy uh, and he was this I really was impressed with him. I, I loved talking to him. I got chances to, I would always go over and bag for him as much as I could. You were good. Yeah. I was good at it. Yeah. And Clay was well, really well known. He would tell me about, I think you had won some contests as a, 
in high school, I had won the state food marketing yes. competition. So these, did you guys go to high school? In no, the same? Clay no. went to Hillcrest. I went to East. Yeah, oh, but we, we both worked. I worked Smith's. at Ninth and Ninth South because my dad knew the manager <laughs> up there. And okay, so that's okay, how so we knew. neighboring areas. Kind yeah. Of. Okay. Well, so we just had this thing in common from early on, earlier on, and then it came up again when I ran into Laurie in Austria or in yeah it's in Salzburg. And just to make the story short here, because uh, it's not really the main point, uh, years later, Lara and I eventually dated. Uh, we, I'd been back five years from my mission, and that was the first time. Her brother, her cousin, uh, Merlin, set us up, and we went out on a date, and we, we knew pretty quickly that we were meant for each other. And, and so then I was part of Clay's family very soon after that. So... One thing, one thing that's really fascinated me is how people in your life, you know, how those threads come back together and things like that. And this has happened again in this case. So a third time Clay's in my life in an interesting way with an impact on how I am experiencing life. And it's fascinating to me. So you had a good mission? Yeah. You were, were you pretty devout and committed? I was, you might call me, I might have been... Something of a excessively devout missionary. So super zealot. I was. I remember the time coming up to my mission. I was the kind of person that I didn't want to read the scriptures. I got scriptures a year before uh, I went on my mission, and they just sat on my desk in my room and gathered dust. I remember the day I brushed off the dust. It was very close to when I went into the MTC, and I had this real strong sense at that time that my life was going to change, and I wanted it. But before that, I wasn't really devout. I would go to church. It was what my family did. Um, I went to seminary. I graduated from seminary uh, with a little help at the end uh, because I didn't quite qualify to graduate, and they helped me. These kinds of things were like really who I was. I wasn't really devout. Um, but I went on my mission, and I was really interested and focused on being a good missionary. Uh, and I was strict on the rules. I always carried the white handbook in my pocket. I had missionary companions that would comment to me on how I would, might be a little too rigid, things like that. But I felt like I needed to overcome a lot, and I was really committed to it. So, And then from that point, I came back, and I was really thinking, I am going to be a leader in the church. And I started into... Uh, I took... I was in the seminary teacher program at the University of Utah. And I went out and taught seminary as part of the curriculum and things like that. And then I didn't get accepted. And that was one of the first times in my life where I was like, the story's not lining up with what I thought. Because you had expected you would get in and that would be your destiny. Yes. Yeah. And And the level of that I thought God was telling me this. What do you mean? Um... You, I thought my, I, when I would pray and when I would, uh, think about who I was, it was this thing about being a leader in the church, about teaching and being a theological leader in the church. And my mother tells me early on, she, she has memories of me very early telling her that she thought I, that I thought I was going to be the prophet someday. You just can't imagine the kind of. I mean, it's a kind of hubris when you think about it. Yeah. From a very young age. Yeah. That was me. And it didn't align very well with a lot of things about how I actually behaved uh, as a kid. As I said, I wasn't particularly devout. Right. I was just obedient. And when, and when you choose the CES path, yeah. you don't choose a lot of other things, right? I mean, it's a pretty significant investment. Right. Yeah. It, it shapes the direction and your future career possibilities, right? Right. I was I I had this idea of my life that I was going to serve. And whatever those whatever little I knew about what it meant to be to serve in the church and to be a leader in the church, I thought I knew what it was. But I'm saying you could study yeah. become a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, right. or yeah. computer scientist. Yeah. But Some, if you go towards CES, yeah. That's that right. puts you on a path, right? That's right. And that's where I thought I was supposed to go. And right. I'm just saying it, the, the, that moment when 
I was told we're not going to accept you in t- as a teacher yeah. in the system was a real one of the first times where I was like something's different and I realized it was because I wasn't actually a very good seminary teacher and they probably recognized that but it but you know how you just con- I was basically telling myself but I'm also this is what I'm supposed to do yeah. And it was one of those moments where I was realizing there's some disconnect between what I think and what is. Yeah. And it was one of the first moments in my life where I was like, my life's not going to go, isn't going the way I thought it was supposed to go. So is this before or after you were married to Lori? This was before. Okay. Years before. But you, but you still married Lori. Yep. And, and then... got married in the temple. Got married in the temple. And... And then when... Take us to the point where you started questioning. So, I have three children, and it was I. I was it was ten years later, maybe. My, I baptized my oldest, and uh, and my middle dot, my middle child. And, and were you at Microsoft by this point? So what happened? This, this is just a. Try to put this as succinctly as possible. At one point, we decided, Larry and I decided, after me struggling in the real estate and banking industries in Salt Lake City, that we were going to move away. So I took a job in in, uh, in the Washington area, just looked it up, flew up there, interviewed. It was with Cobalt Banker Bain as a corporate relocation person. Uh, and we just came up here. And I wasn't getting paid very much, but we just decided we needed to move for a lot of reasons. And so we did. And it wasn't to take a job. We took the job to move. Does right. that make sense? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So we came up here and we spent a couple of years where I really struggled uh, and eventually got into real estate full time and didn't do very well. Part of this was because I thought I was a salesperson. It was all linked back to my past of me being the kind of person that influences people, that has a message that, and I didn't do very well. I, and, it was, and there was a point where I was unemployed. And it was during this time period, because I was unemployed, I was meeting with the bishop. They were trying to help me get back on the employment track because they were helping us with our rent and things like that. We were taking uh, Bishop Storehouse. I mean, it was dire in my... And this was all in the year or so before I met you. Uh, And this is part of... The experience that I came out of where the world suddenly was different than I always thought it was. The the bishop was doing his best to try to help me, but there wasn't much he could do. Mm. I had a friend friends that I'd met, one particular friend that was Jewish, that truly did help me. He helped me get a job at Microsoft. He took me under his wing, helped me interview and prepare, and he because he said, I see in you some real latent talent and you let's get you involved in this. And someone not a member of the church helped me in that way. And I, it never occurred to me that that's how the world actually works. Yeah, Cause we forgot I those thought people. The church was those gonna, are the people we forget. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and yet we were living in this beautiful community where there's this thriving Jewish community. On Is that Mercer Island? Island? Mercer Island. Yeah. Right. Great people. Mm-hmm. And I was realizing that, the people that I always thought, in particular the bishop, was the uh, representative of Christ on earth and was the most inspired person in my life, was really struggling with some things in his interviews with me uh, to help me and really went off the path with me in some ways that really bothered me. Uh, there was, I think I told you this, there was a moment where he actually offered me a brochure, pushed it across the desk and said, I think you're gay would you read this? And I realized <laughs> you're looking for a job? <laughs> there's a total disconnect here. Right. During this time, a couple of things happened. He, that happened. And of course I'm still in this mode of the Bishop is the Bishop. I know he's a man, but he's the Bishop. He has a special mantle. Right. And yet I'm, and so I'm not rejecting what he's saying. I would just saying, I don't think so. Bishop, it's okay. <laughs> After the fact, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> Because there was also a moment where he said, in frustration, I think, he didn't want to have to take my wife and kids from me. Uh, that kind of thing. 
just kind of me- probably meant to goad me into doing something. I had those experiences, right? And then this friend helped me get a job at Microsoft and I got a contract for a year. So at this time where that had been happening was the first time in my life where I was realizing this bishop is just a guy. And that never had really occurred to me. You'd think it would, right? But sometimes when you're raised in the church, you get ideas about what it means to be the bishop that really dominate your thinking to the point where you set aside any doubts or anything that you might have observed or heard. And I was actually having a, something that couldn't be denied, where he was mixing up his concerns over uh, some other things in his life with me, and it was impacting me. So maybe he was gay? No, uh, he, his son had come out as gay. Oh, okay. So he was seeing gayness everywhere. I think so. The whole world was a rainbow. Apparently. Okay. (laughs) So this was all happening at the time. And so I got this contract. I was working at Microsoft. And during some downtime, I was spending, I signed up for an an LDS discussion email alias. On Yahoo? or No, it was in. Internal. Oh, the Microsoft, Microsoft had yeah, yeah. internal. Okay. I just learned this. So like and I'm more like, checking Microsoft this out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm getting these mails. It's like an exchange list. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So I'm doing my work and I'm seeing these mails come across of people talking about, hey, let's go to the temple or, hey, we're, what about the gospel topic for, how's your lesson prep going? Or what do you think of this topic and stuff? <laughs> and there's this guy named John DeLynn who's talking on there too, right? And he's, He's the guy that's basically saying, hey, I ran into this thing. Have any of you guys heard of this? I'm just putting it out there. Kind of, what do you think? Um, And they were things I'd never heard, you know? Uh, And people can say, yeah, you should have heard. If you just looked into it, you would have heard. But I'm telling you, in my experience growing up, I never wanted to look into it because I thought it was wrong. But this is the first time in my life where I was hearing from people that I thought, I think I can, tr- I think I trust people that I, I'm hearing talk here and they're struggling with these topics and I'd never heard them before. So John's talking about this stuff and I'm just, I just want to share this with you guys because I love John <laughs> uh, and the way he goes about these kinds of things. But there were, he was causing some trouble <laughs> on that alias. Uh, people didn't want to hear, some people didn't want to hear these topics brought up and they didn't want to. Because the the problem with the email alias is you get the mail whether you're interested or not. It's coming in <laughs> one after another, and there are different topical threads coming in. And sometimes people just say, shut up, stop replying to this thread. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that was going on. And John tended to be on those kinds of threads, right? And there was a stake president in this mail list, too, that worked at Microsoft. And he was involved in talking. Richardson? Was Stevenson? it Richardson? Yeah, he was a Bellevue stake president yeah, or yeah. Redmond stake president yeah. or something. And there was a little friction and stuff going on. I think you may have met with him or something. And there was just these conversations and lots of spinning off side conversations and stuff. And I was just kind of party to it for a while. But I was interested and I was following it and I would start talking about it. And I started reading some things that were being talked about that I'd never heard before. So this is my first. And again, I'm saying it's the first time I was willing or able to somehow entertain some tough topics, as you put it. And I just want to tell everyone, the thing is, at some point, John got kicked out of the main mail thread, essentially. You kicked yourself out. You went out. We started a separate private alias called LDS Tough Topics. LDS it was just causing too much trouble. It was, it was work, People you know? didn't like it. Yeah. They didn't want... There were points in, in, the other, in the main thing where I was getting mails, people challenging me to meet them at the temple for a temple session because they wanted to see if I actually mm-hmm. would show up kind of thing kind of testing your loyalty to the church yeah that kind of stuff was going on on the main threat thing and you didn't want that and i just remember needing someone to talk to yeah. right and i didn't have facebook right or, there was no know, internet there forums. Was no twitter there was no facebook i don't feel like i was in my heart was trying to cause trouble i was just <laughs> desperate to try and right. make sense of all this right i think you verify it and you know anyway you'd been teaching seminary yeah. and gospel doctrine and you ran into internet stuff as yeah. you were prepping. Yeah. That story was a, one of the original internet stories, right? Yeah. And you were ad- doing that before there was any, there was no web, you know, blogosphere or anything like yeah. that. This was That's just right. early on yeah. when we were still just talking in mail. So we start, so you started this and invited some of us that had been kind of interested 
to join that LDS Tough Topics alias. And then we really started talking. And that's when, as John mentions, we would do things like go to lunch, uh, meet actually face to face and, and, uh, get to know each other. And just like, you know, just like our kids have learned when you meet people and see who they really are, you, it changes your perception, perception of the topics they're talking about or the thing they represent. The, you know, if you know people that are gay, it changes your perspective. You can't believe certain things anymore that you maybe believed before because now you know real people. And that's kind of how I was experiencing the tough topic stuff. I was meeting people that I respected, that I understood their struggles and kind of and affiliated with it in some ways and was sympathetic and empathetic and whatever. And you were there early on. And at some point, it wasn't very long after that before I was like, this is not at all what I thought the church was. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I remember us being on different pages by the end where I we was were. still kind of trying to defend it and yeah. trying to make it work. Yeah. And you were like, uh-uh. Yeah. We, I think I'm atheist. I think I'm done. How do you explain how fast you just said I'm done? You may still attend yeah. it, but in your mind and heart you were done. How do you explain how fast you were done and yet... It almost seemed like I was being an apologist at that point. What do you remember there? Well, first of all, let me just say, even to this day, you're John DeLynn, the way you were always then, too. You know, you're trying to help people. And my perspective from the time I was a kid was much more theological. It was much more, it wasn't about as much about keeping families together and doing the things that don't disrupt relationships. You were about that. I was more concerned about what is true. Because that's how I taught, that's what I was taught. We have ancestors that left their families behind for what is true. They didn't get overly concerned with how their wife and children who wouldn't go with them felt. Yeah, they'd leave a wife or they kids if the kids weren't going to come, They said, this is true, and I, if you won't come with me, I have to leave. And they went off and married other people. And had other children. I had a different life. And in some ways, that's what Mormonism requires. In, in many ways. The, in order to be the family that Mormonism teaches, means you're either all together or you're not. There's no... And so, so you were much more concerned early on about keeping families together and keeping members from uh, that were finding these things from derailing and, having, and getting divorced unnecessarily. And saying, I was much more concerned about this isn't at all what I was passionately about. Yeah. That I was ready to get run over, you know, to to die for. It and I was angry about that. Um and that's my failing. That's my personal failing. Um fortunately over Why do the you years, call it a failing? Because in a different life, in a different context, I would have I would have left my family over this. I would have left my children because of a, an affinity for truth over, over family, over anything. And yet you decided it wasn't true and stayed with your wife and kids. Be, and this has been a long, torturous kind of... I wish I could say that it was just a decision I made and everything was happy after that. It wasn't. It's never been that way. It's always been, there are things we don't talk about, about our lives. You and? And, my, and Laurie. We don't because it's too painful. You, it it so would drive us apart to right. talk about this. So it's better not to talk about so it. So what do you do? How do you navigate that you just set up walls of what you can and can't talk about? Uh, no, it's just that if we ever broach those subjects, we it immediately gets so to the point where we can't talk about it anymore. So we just don't. So I, I don't say I wouldn't say we set up walls. They're just our walls. Um, and also, I met with a counselor on my own for some time, and she was telling me how important it is for me to have a relationship with my kids, and was really pushing me to do something about that. But it required that I was, I'd be willing to just be who I am and, you know, it's okay. This is who I am. This is what I believe. And I'm still your dad. And you're going to know it all. And I was never able to do that. 
to tell them where you sit at the my church? Kids. My kids don't. They know every most of what they know about me. They've probably heard from Larry. So you've I've never been able to talk really directly. talk to my kids. How old are your kids? Well, I have two daughters in college now, and one in, and a son in high school. And they don't know where you stand relative to the church. They don't know from me. Right. So have you been like Temple Recommend holding active? No. Holding a calling? That, that was part of the thing is, and really part of the struggle is we, at some point I said, Larry, I can't baptize Josh. It would be wrong. So my father baptized him. And Laura's brother, her other brother, uh, confirmed him. And I was just there. And the whole time I was thinking, I have to choose between my children seeing me be true to what I really am, even though they don't know it, they don't know what I am, or see them... find out at some time later in my life or their life or after I'm dead that I pretended. And to me, that was less bearable, that thought. So I guess it's, it's again, the same thing. I'm more focused on what was the legacy our ancestors left for us? What, if I'm going to be loyal to that, it means that I have to think about what I'll leave them, my own children, and not so much about being too concerned about whether they see me as a good dad or as a good Mormon dad. Um, and the cost of that has been, and, and when I say my feelings, it's because for whatever reason, I've, I've never been comfortable just saying, kids, this is who your dad is, and this is what I think. I've always been real of two minds. I wanted them to think, see me being honest, but then I'm dishonest because I won't tell them. And why not just five, ten years ago, sit them all down, they're in high school, this is what I do and don't believe? Honestly, I was too afraid it would destroy my family. Yeah. Meaning your marriage. My marriage, my their really they're real, here's the thing they're at this point up until clay i'm pretty much the only one now my sister left the church pretty much and but then she passed away so it's just been me for the most part in my family of seven kids that has more or less openly said i don't go to church and i don't really believe it but I always really felt that if I pushed too hard on this topic, that I would lose my kids. That may be an unfounded. It may not have ever happened, but I was so worried about that and afraid. that. And that's part of the message here I want to share, is that I think it's real. The fear of what we'll lose is a powerful, powerful, suppressive force on people. Because we do lose things if we speak out. We lose our families. And I've, been, I've felt, I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything in the world anymore true enough or more true than family at this point. So I'm willing to even not tell the truth about who I am to my children for a time and not push it. If, if in any way it gives us time to keep the family together. Um, so so we've that we've so, always... Yeah. We've always admired you for that. And I would have said this three months ago. I always admired you for the way you suppressed. We know you. We knew you weren't going to church. But the way you suppressed those feelings for the sake of your family was something I admired. And I, I didn't know what was going on with you about the church. We didn't talk about it. So, Clay, isn't that weird? So just, it's just weird. To pause it is for a second. Weird. Yeah. You were... So, so tell me if I'm wrong, but, like, Laurie would maybe... I can imagine how it works in a marriage. Laurie would be disappointed in you that you weren't believing anymore. And she would look to her brother, Clay, yeah. and say, yeah. while well, Clay's the inspiration, this he's is, faithful. This is Daddy Uncle Clay. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so, Clay, that's, you're, that's, you're being, at this time, yeah. you're being held up as, a, as sort of the faithful 
devout guy and you're seeing your brother-in-law fall away yeah. and you know your sister's mm. really respecting you. What's that like for you when, when you're seeing this happen with Matt? It's hard because... What were you feeling at the time? I, what I was feeling like, and I hate to say this, but I just felt like something's going on with Matt, but I don't know what it is. Um, he, he wants to drink coffee and drink alcohol and doesn't believe in the church. But I, I'm embarrassed that I didn't ask why. I didn't. Like, it, I didn't is that mind blowing? Like it's what happens. What it's is what the church does to families. The church is the most important thing to you at this point, yeah. right? Yeah. You love your sister and your brother in law. Mm-hmm. You see that he's struggling, and so the natural response is to never talk about it. Right. Yeah. Explain that. It. Explain that. Is well, it that you didn't care? Is it you were scared of losing your own faith? Is it you didn't want to pry? Like, how do you explain that? You just yeah. what's it, more important? It's unexplainable. You you you. If somebody asks you what's more important, family or the church, ah, the people would people would say church. There's some people who would say church, and I wouldn't have said that. Family is more important, but you know, taking care of your family. But when it comes to the church topic, you just don't talk about it, and that's one of the aspects about the church that is kind of cultish. It's you just don't talk about it. You say that now only six weeks from six being weeks. a true believer, right? Yeah. I mean my story, I'm not gonna talk we're, like that. I mean, I'm gonna tell you I love the church and it's only been six weeks and but because of Matt, I, I feel like I owe it to him to sit here by him and say, Brother, I'm sorry that you were you have to go through that by yourself for so long and that's the influence of the church. It tears apart families. It tears apart families. Well, it also keeps families together. Because, Thank I mean, heavens. Well, let's we'll just say it keeps families together in a manner that's not, not necessarily has good effects over time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this could have gone in many different ways, and it still might. We don't know where our lives are going, right? Um, but I will say, part of the reason why I feel like I... I mean, I don't blame Clay or anybody for not even asking me why I'm not going to church today. I mean, I would be at Larry at Clay's mom's house and I would just stay home and they would all go to church. And no one ever asked me why I do that. Talk really quickly about what the hardest parts about just being the quiet non-believer in a immediate and extended family of believers. What's been, what have been the hardest parts about that? So, and okay. what's the toll that you think it's taken? Well, I think it's definitely, it's been really difficult to, to distinguish my own anger about the situation I'm in from anger towards anyone around me. And I think my family has felt that to some degree. I've feared that they felt that, and I've definitely felt it. I've been very confused about what my what I'm feeling a lot of the times, and it probably comes out in a lot of ways. I know for a fact that I spent time. Well, I would get frustrated with me for distancing myself, even though I'm in the same house, for going in another room and just being on, by myself. And I couldn't really explain it except that I didn't. It was intense discomfort, and you shouldn't feel that way. So you felt this discomfort about having to hide who you are yeah. and be different. And you would you would act that out by isolating yourself within the walls of your own home. I, I, I even to this day I can't really honestly come to terms with the boundaries between my discomfort over having to hide anything or just flat out being angry because uh, people rub me the wrong way. I can't really tell you where the boundary is, but I can tell you that it all feeds together. And my and the most I think that there's two things that have been the most difficult for me, and that is to not be who I think I really am when I'm carefree and caring and loving. Uh, when Clay's grandparents were alive was before, mostly before I'd fallen away from faith, and I have great memories of spending time playing games with you guys, and I was way more engaged in the family in those years than I have been since. And how do you explain that? And so it just also, drives a big wedge. It drives a big wedge that I can't get my mind around in order to address it from my own side. Feeling, I, I honestly have always felt like it's too big. I don't know what to do with it. So just devil's advocate. Like, number yeah. one, I'm guessing that Clay and his family weren't like mean to you no. and like excluding you. Hey, no. It's almost like you're excluding yourself, exactly. right? Exactly. 
Yeah. Not, so what? What? So I would just say to you, we'll just play the games and have the fun. Like, yeah. why isolate yourself? You're doing it to yourself. Exactly. I guess that's what I'm saying. Is it was never. It's still not clear to me. I think when I. When I tell you, John, that I think I have personal feelings here, I'm trying to be honest about it. I no, but I, the I world feel... isn't the way I wanted it to be, and I've been angry about that. And I take it out on people in some ways, and that's my personal failing. So you're grouchy, irritable, removed. hard to understand, distant. I mean, Laurie has a fair gripe with me that I didn't tell her that I had stopped believing for weeks and weeks, and only till. She approached me about it because I wasn't acting normal and things like that. And that that was a breach of trust between us. And she's right. Man, I got to tell, I got to tell you, you, you said that you've been angry. And I, the thing that strikes me, and I would have said this, like I said, three months ago, I would have said this. Going through what you've gone through, the lack of anger is what's amazing to me. I mean, he has, I mean, we're, we're a family that gets together for a week, week and a half at Christmas time every year. And we get together in the summertime every year. I mean, this is a guy who would get together with an absolute super devout family, only one, every time, two times a year. That's how he spends his vacation. And <laughs> I, I don't know how you did it. My hat's off to you. Yeah. And, and I, I'm so, I'm just so thankful that you were so, you were more committed to the family than you even realize. And just suppressing your own feelings. I don't, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you did it. Probably. Well, you know, I, I relate to what you're saying because I'm, I feel estranged from members of my right. extended family. Yeah. It's definitely, especially in the past, caused me to be angry and irritable with family. And there's no question that with certain siblings, with certain, you know, hmm. in-laws, with certain uh, nephews and nieces, I just don't have a relationship with them. And I want to, and I used to, yeah. and I don't now. And I know that they view me similarly to the way you're describing. And so, you know, so I, I, I could try and fill in the blanks, but if someone were to say, just be that fun, happy uncle, brother-in-law, son-in-law, why, why do it to yourself? You're doing it to yourself. Yeah. What would you say? I would say... Without, without being self-effacing, talk about the, the point of view yeah. of why that's hard. Well, it's really the, there was this moment uh, where I'd met with the state president with Laurie at the point where I was deciding I'd, I can't believe this church anymore. And we were, it was actually with the council and the state presidency. And there was this moment where he had said to me, why can't you just pretend that you believe to keep things together? And I had that one of those kind of emotional reactions to that of just the world isn't what I thought it was. There are people in the church who would say that in positions of leadership who would who don't who wouldn't just bear testimony and say, I know you don't. But here's this is why. No, they said, why can't you just pretend? <laughs> to me, it was like, again. The world isn't what I thought it was. It's something different. And I was getting hit over the head with that. The, the, the very notion of just pretending something just to keep, just was what I'd done my entire life, essentially. To keep parents happy, to keep my friends happy, you know, to be the person that people expect you to be. And I was enough, I'd had enough of that. I'm not doing that anymore. And yet, in order to live day to day with my family and keep it together, I was having to be quiet and not say anything and not, I felt, it was imposed on myself. And I'll tell you part of the reason for that is that I have a great, having lived a TBM life, I have a great deal of empathy and sympathy for what it might feel like to have a loving, someone you love and trust betray your faith. And knowing that and feeling that myself and sometimes often wondering, is this worth it? Those doubts. 
would kind of keep, I always stay in this tension of, I can't undermine my children's faith. I can't risk my marriage. And so I'm going to suppress parts of myself that I know I would be offended by if I were them. And doing that, when you do that to yourself, you're going to be angry because you're suppressing yourself. You're, you're, it's a kind of abuse. Self, you're abusing yourself. And you can't, and I couldn't figure out a way to get past that. Even with seeing a counselor and working through it and being told yes, and yes, I know I'm going to go try and do this, but I just couldn't for my, my own failings. So for and you, so it's been anger for me has come from a sense of being helpless, you know, just being, I can't do anything about this. It, I think that's kind of normal for humans. If they feel like they're trapped, you're, you're, you're unhappy and you're, and there's, there's nothing that can resolve that until you can somehow get untrapped kind of thing. And that's kind of what, I, how I explain and it. So some people just blow up the marriage. Yeah. Some people just divorced. break it off. Yeah. Um, Start a new life. Right. But you didn't choose that. I didn't want that. So, oh, man, honestly, I do. I love Laurie so much. I love my children. You want, you want everything. And the truth about life is you can't. You can't have everything. Unless you lie a little bit. And I would, you know, it's just, I think... It's, that's part of what makes, that's part of why I'm here today. I just want people to know, I think it's not, there's no clear, easy answers to any of this stuff. So and for you so far, has it been worth it? I think so. I keep hoping that they'll be, the day will come when my children and I will know, will, they'll know, who I, they'll know more about what I actually think. And, uh, and maybe I'll be able to tell them without worrying about whether It'll cause un undue friction in my family. Uh, and that tends to kind of, as they get older, you think maybe they'll come to me at some point and ask me where they'll listen to this and they'll get a better idea. I'll just say, I really am so glad that my mother told me about Chester Clausen. It, how tragic it would be if I never knew that. Why? Well, he's my great grandfather. Why wouldn't you want to know that? Why would you be? Why would you be more proud of the guy that was a state president or a president of the church than this other guy? What is it? It's only the church. That's the only difference. And to me, that's just like that's heartbreaking, kind of stuff. So, can you have a happy marriage or a good enough marriage? I think so. Even if you're on totally different pages? Uh, it just depends on who you are, I think. Larry and I are very... Uh, I feel like we're committed to each other. And in some ways, it's like, we don't... I, this is how I feel. I, there's no one else I'd want to be with, honestly. I don't... It, it scares me to even think about alternatives. Because I don't want it. I don't want that. So, in some ways, it's like, whatever price you have to pay to stay together is a price worth paying. And so, you can see how this feeds into that larger thing of sometimes someone in the past thought that there was a truth that was more valuable than family. And I've had a problem with that as in my experience. And that's kind of direct, kind of drives me to the, like, it's okay. Your marriage doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to, it's okay to have these challenges. And then you realize as you get to know other people that other people have these kinds of problems too. And then you realize that so much of your vision of yourself has been something that was manufactured and handed to you since you were a kid and never was true. It was never true. You, you, I know from my fa experience growing up in my family that there were things that you, no one else knew about our family. And you wouldn't want them to know. Even though they may have looked... We looked, have looked like I a think model. from outside, some people probably thought we were a model Mormon family. Uh, 
and they'd be they'd be right because the evidence was there for it. But but that kind of what kind of family is that that you're putting on a show and not talking about your real problems because it's too shameful? You wouldn't want it to get out. You wouldn't want people to know that you're related to a guy that stopped believing and started drinking and hanging out in billiards, billiard parlors and stuff. Yeah. So you're saying there were family secrets in your family growing up that just weren't talked about and that no one would have seen. Right. And as the the older you get, you know, the more people you meet, you realize that that's actually going on everywhere. Yeah. I was on, on my mission. There were times where I thought, I'm doing everything I can to be a good missionary here. Only after my mission did I find out that some people that I thought were also doing everything I could to become be great missionaries weren't. They were like hanging out with the sisters, going on trips, doing all stuff I'd never heard of. Yeah. Partly because I had the blinders on and I wouldn't have believed it yeah. if, even if I heard it. Yeah. So to go from that perspective on the world to where I am now feels like a totally different life. Yeah. <laughs> well, for you... Yeah, I have a brother. <laughs> but for you, you uh, you're glad you did it. You're glad you stuck with Lori. You're glad you kept the family together. Yeah. yeah. And for you, it was worth the pain and the sadness and the anger. You, Are you still glad you lost your faith? Are you still glad you're? Well, let's just say, let's put it this way: it, it's hard to say that you're glad you lost you lost your faith when, in reality, this thing happened, and it can't be undone. Once it happens, can't unring the bell. So, how can you talk in terms of glad or not glad or anything like this? Is just this is my life, and I imagine that this similar kind of thing happened to our ancestors. That at some point they heard a message, and they couldn't unhear it, and it so rang to that true to some other things in their lives and hurt things that they'd hoped for and stuff that they could not escape the gravity of that message. And we can talk all day long about how people choose stuff. But we are drawn to things, and that's part of humanity. We the, things have gravity for us that we can't escape, depending on our personalities and our. But with the magic wand, would you go back? No, because I mean, this is the same kind of question you would ask: if would you not take that red pill? You know, yeah. some people might want to go back. I never want to. Because, I mean, having read things from, I mean, I'll just say, I was thinking before this interview, who would I want to say has been the person in the past where I was like, would look up to a state president or to a prophet as my exemplar or to a character in the Book of Mormon of someone I want to strive to be. Today, it's Carl Sagan, you know, it's, I was like, I've read something of his life. He shared things of, of what it was like growing up for him and I think it's beautiful and I, I care a great deal about the message he, how that's impacted my life. And if I could go back, I would never experience that. I would never have that perspective. Why would you want to undo that? It's how I feel about it. And just like our parents, our ancestors made decisions that caused us to be where we are today. I hope that just by being the person I am with all my feelings and strengths that my children and their children will reap the benefits and the, and what can I do, but just let it be kind of thing. So I'll I'll ask you to finish a sentence and we'll, it will end this part of the interview on this question. So in spite of all the pain and the suffering, the risk of being forgotten in history, the compartmentalization, the lack of authenticity with your children, the the walls with your with your wife, the anger and the disappointment you feel that life has not turned out the way it is. This is all you're still glad that you've been through this because because it feels true. It feels true. I, you've often said warts and all with reference to the church and things like that. At some point, I had to come to terms with. The human, the human experience is not all beautiful all the time. That there, that you have to accept the good and the bad together as one beautiful thing. Why would I want it to be different than what I have, kind of thing? 
And, and uh, let, me, let me just end with this thing. There's some point where I did care deeply about the legacy. And maybe I've given you the impression, and maybe I do still care about my legacy. But at some point I've come to terms with the fact that most of us, the vast majority of us, are forgotten to history. That is Brigham Young is someone who eventually will be forgotten to history. But, and we just have to accept that because that's how, that's the truth. The truth isn't that someday we'll have power and authority because of the number of children that we have and stuff like that. The truth is that we will be forgotten. So what's it about for you if it's not about leaving a legacy? Uh, well, it is about leaving a legacy to some sense because I, it is, at some level, I have succeeded in my creation in, in the sense that I have lived a life and I've contributed in whatever way I had to contribute and I have children and if I'm lucky they'll have children and those children will have children and what more could you want? Anything else, if, you, if, you, if we say we want more than that we're basically saying that that's not enough. Why would we say that it's not enough? Based on what? Is it not enough to see your children succeed? To live for that? Why is that not enough? But the church tells us it's not enough. But that's what you're living for? To help your kids if succeed? They, you know, and, and what is success for them? Part of what I have to live, accept is that how, whatever lives they choose, whatever experiences, choices they make, whatever struggles they have in their life because of me, is just life. And we're let, let, let that go and be okay with it. This is kind of where I am right now. I don't really know what else to do or what else to say. So, But you've given, you've had, you've had, you've been a father to children you're helping them be the best they can be and live the life they want to live. In my own messed up way. Yeah. What else can you ask than to have the chance to do that? So for you, it's about family. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that different than what we were always taught? That we should shed our families to some degree. degree? In the Instead of the afterlife the and, the of the future. and heaven and right. the kingdoms. That it's okay to cause our children pain if it means we, sh we keep the blood of their blood off of our garments. Right. It's okay. It's better to drive them away than to let them be who they are. Yeah. Why would we want that? But that's stuff we've been taught since we were kids about what the world is. And for yeah. now, how it is. For now, it is with your children. If they make a different choice, yeah. it's what for you? Um... There's some combination of, I can't possibly know if that's the right choice for them or not. I don't have enough perspective. And some obvious, I can't escape who I am and hope that they find their way if I think it's not the right choice. But I'm probably not going to choose to reject them. No matter what. No matter what. And to me, that's, I mean, that seems like uh, some... If you can get to that point, it seems like a lot of pain to getting, getting there is nothing. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I don't know how things are going to play out, but I do feel like there was a time where I wasn't happy with myself for who I was, and now I'm okay with it. Yeah. And that's, some, that's pretty big, I think. Yeah. So.